Welcome to Martin Methodist Church's Sanctuary Service. My name is Doug Baker and I'm the lead pastor. Today we continue the current sermon series, The Lord is My Shepherd. Let's join in as the message is underway. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me aside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, it's good to be with you as we continue our sermon series, The Lord is My Shepherd. Today, encouraged and blessed, let us pray. Lord, in these moments, I ask that you would speak through me, that your people would hear a word from you, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Last month, a dear friend of mine and uh, uh, husband of our staff member, Regina Childress, Larry Childress, uh, passed away. And uh, Regina shared with me uh, something this week from a uh, blogger and author, Tim Challies, entitled, The Song I Sing in the Darkness. And his words really captured, I think, what we've been trying to stay with the Psalm of Psalm 23. No work of art is more beautiful, more valuable, more irreplaceable than the 23rd Psalm. The lines of the greatest poets cannot match its imagery, the words of the greatest theologians, its profundity. Credentialed academics may wrestle with it, but yet young children understand it. It is read over cradles and cribs, over coffins and crypts, at births and at deaths, at weddings and at funerals. It is prayed in closets, it is sung in churches, it is chanted in cathedrals. The psalm dries more crying eyes, it raises more drooping hands, it strengthens more weakened knees than any man or angel could ever. It tends to be very kind, the kind of wound, it tends to the very kind of wound and ministers to every kind of sorrow. To trade it for the wealth of the worlds of the world would be the worst of trades because David's great psalm employs one of the most beautiful images, that of a shepherd and his sheep. And it assures us of the greatest truths, that God is present with his people. I'd rather know the words of this one song than all the great hymns of the Christian faith. I'd rather lose everything with a shepherd at my side than to gain the world alone. Great words. Truly capturing what we've been trying to convey as we've been studying the 23rd Psalm these last three weeks together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And today we're gonna to move through this journey and, and find uh, the contentment that we can find because the shepherd's care will lead us even through the dark valleys and we'll end up today by celebrating that our cup truly overflows. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Sometimes to get to the higher ranges, which we will talk about in just a moment, the shepherd must lead his sheep through those darkened valleys where there are avalanches and rock slides and poisonous plants and dangerous animals. There are dangers in the darkness and in the valleys as there are dangers and struggles and trials in the life that you and I live. But we are not to lay down in the valleys. The gesture of the shepherd is to continue to move us through these valleys, walking it with us so that we can get to the places where he is trying to lead us to. A not well-known story of lying down in dark places comes from the English royalty. I read recently of Queen Victoria who ruled the British Empire from 1837 until 1901. The love of her life was Francis Albert Augustus Charles Emmanuel. What a great name, right? She married him on February the 10th, 1840. It was truly the happiest day of her life. And the royal couple was married for 21 years and had nine children until Prince Albert died of typhoid fever in 1861. His death threw Victoria into profound grief. She entered into the valley and never got through it. She stopped living altogether 
Oh yes, she was breathing and walking around, but Queen Victoria was not living. She had his room turned into a shrine, and every day for the rest of her life, she had his bed linens changed, his clothes were laid out to put a basin of water from which he could shave. She slept clutching his nightshirt. She wore black every day for the rest of her life. She was nicknamed the Widow of Windsor. She stopped living the day that he died. She laid down in the valley of the shadow of death. Now, friends, I'm not suggesting that we've run through grief. Grief has its own journey for everyone. But you must walk through the griefs that you encounter, whether it's the death of a child, the death of a spouse or a parent, whether it's the ending of a relationship with a divorce or the estrangement with children. We can get stuck in our grief if we don't work our grief and allow God to walk us through it. Sometimes we grieve over the loss of our health or the loss of employment. But God's desire from Scripture is to move us to beauty from the ashes that we may find ourselves. God calls us to a resurrection that follows the Good Friday and the grieving that is there. If not, we stop living. We stop loving. We surrender to the fear that life could be any way other than the way that we knew it. But the shepherd has a vision for us. He wants us to walk through. He wants us to grow and to learn and to, to, to continue to love and to end up on the other side. I read recently a story of a man named Norman Hoffman. It's more of a story to me because I know Norm personally. He is a friend of my daughter Rebecca and her husband Trey. In fact, I think they would call him his mentor. He served in the army as does my son-in-law as an army reservist. They have that connection there. But while they were attending a church together while in college, Norm took an interest in them and found out they were engaged, that Trey was going into ministry, and he has continued to walk alongside them. In 2015, Norm's wife of 47 years passed away, leaving him as a widower. About two months, Norm, with his strong uh, army discipline, decided that he was going to get through his grief. He was going to handle things. He was just going to go on with life, but he got stuck, and he realized he could not handle it on his own. He decided to get some counseling. He saw a psychologist for therapy. He decided to retire from his work as an accountant at that time, and he decided to begin to attend church more regularly and to involve himself in more ways in the church. He started attending Baylor's lifelong learning classes. He changed where he parked at church. He changed where he sat in church. And he moved his wedding ring from his left ring finger to his right ring finger. All of this was because he was moving through. He was growing, he was learning, and he was finding new joys and new ways to serve as he had never served before. Interestingly enough, among these changes, he was invited to speak at a local high school in Waco about his days in the Army while he was in Vietnam. And what happened there was an interesting healing. As he began to unburden his heart and tell of his stories, things that his wife didn't even know about, things that he'd been carrying deeply within him and painfully for 50 years, God began to make him whole again and to take him to places where he never thought he could go again. Norm was coming back to life, an abundant life in Christ. And yes, he would always remember his wife, Lynn, but I think he rejoices in that with Christ, his shepherd, he became a more loving person, a more helpful person, and a person who continued the ministry that they did together of investing in others in the Baylor community. And like Norm, we can have confidence, even as we face the darkest valleys, we know that God is with us. And the shepherd wants to move us through the griefs that we experience and move us on to higher places. John Orberg in his book, God is Closer Than You Think, states that God's most frequent promise in the Bible is this, I will be with you. Starting with Genesis, Adam and Eve in the garden, ending with revelations and the proclamation that God is now with his people and God's people dwell with him. And then all in between with Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and Amos and Mary and the disciples and Paul, 
the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle, the Temple, the Pillar of Cloud, and the Pillar of Fire. And then most of all, Jesus Christ, whose name is Emmanuel. God is with us. The message is clear that God is truly with us. Even in the darkest valleys that you might find yourself in today, you continue to move along with the shepherd and he will lead you to those higher pastures. The scripture continues to say that God has for us a rod and a staff that comfort us. In fact, yes, last week's sermon, as I preached this in the 830, I had someone actually ask, they didn't know what a rod was. What is a shepherd's rod? And so here's an opportunity to explain it. The rod is a club. It's about 18 inches to two feet long. And the shepherd tucks it in their, their, their waistband around their robe. And that's how in biblical days they would carry the rod and they would have a staff that they would also carry with them. The rod and the staff, they comfort the sheep. If a net predator would come, the, the rod was pulled and there could be a defense of the sheep by the shepherd. If a, if a lamb started wandering to a place it didn't need to go, Paul Breedlove, the rod could be thrown, right? And to wake that shake up, to, to get them back to where they needed to go. And friends, also the, the rod served another purpose, that sheep would pass under the rod for inspection. So if sheep from other folds were together, they would put the rod down as the sheep went by. The shepherd could lift the ear, check the notch to make sure it's one of his sheep. And also, as he's moving over the sheep's back, he can check for scaling or any kinds of diseases or any wounds that the sheep might have hidden by the wool. The rod was a very important tool for the shepherd. In fact, Ezekiel 20, I won't read it for you now, 36 and 37 talks about this biblical image of God and how we, the sheep of his flock, have to pass under his rod to be examined. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me. Lead me in the path everlasting. That's how the rod was used. But then there was the shepherd's staff. The shepherd's staff with the crutch at the top, the curve that could be used to, to grab a sheep, even a baby lamb, and put it near its mother, or to help a sheep that is caught in some kind of trap or, or, or some kind of uh, crevice or, or uh, brambles, to use the crook to pull them out. That shepherd's staff was important. It identified the shepherd so the sheep would know where the shepherd was at all times. And then we move on to, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Here, now that we've gone through these valleys, these crevices, these dangerous places, God's desire is to take us to a table. Now, for the sheep, the table was a mesa, a Spanish word for table. Up high on a mountain range, you'd find a flat level area where the sheep would be fed, a mesa or a table where the sheep would be led for feeding. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And the sheep herders would go maybe three to four weeks ahead of time before the sheep would arrive to prepare that mesa so that it would be, uh, well, poisonous weeds could be eradicated. They would look for signs of predators like snakes or wolves, like coyotes or cougars. They would trap them or kill them or drive them off. The shepherd would also clear out the drinking places that accumulated debris like leaves and twigs where possible carcasses of animals may also be found that were contaminating the water. And lovingly, they would clear those streams and they would dam up these areas for cool places where the sheep could get water to drink, where it would not be rushing, but still waters. Sound familiar? The shepherd's work was oftentimes to go in advance and to prepare the places where the sheep would go. And there's a beautiful image there of this idea of preparing a table for us. I just want to draw your attention real quick to our call to worship this morning from Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. When the people were in captivity, when the northern kingdom was already taken out by the Assyrians and they were held captive while Judah awaited and the Babylonians were growing in strength, Isaiah is prophesying. And what does he say? On the mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast for the people. He will banish and do the doom and gloom. He will banish death and darkness. He'll wipe away our tears. He will set us up in a place of salvation. And I love that idea 
As one commentator put it, the table truly is a place of salvation. And let's just real quickly do a little study here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There was this idea called the altar that was actually very important to the Old Testament worship practices in the outer parts of the, uh, the court of the temple where they would slaughter the animals, including the sacrificial lamb that would take away the sins of the people. There on the table that would occur in the pouring out of the blood. But we know the story of the New Testament, right? Jesus becomes the sacrificial lamb for us. Jesus is the one who lays down his life and dies that we might live. And because of that, we celebrate that he stood behind or knelt behind a table with his disciples on the night of the Lord's Supper, remembering the Passover meal when the death of the passed over Israel. Remember the story? And there we have a new table that is there for us, a table in the upper room where we celebrate, as we have this table in our sanctuary, a figure of salvation right in our midst, where we lift up the cup and we give thanks for the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are fed as his sheep who come and circle this altar, and we are fed the very bread of life that nourishes our souls as we remember what Jesus has done for us. Friends, a table is very important to us, but hear me, this is what I want you to hear. God is a great host. Not only is God a good shepherd, he is a great host who sets for us a great, great table. I was in Jan McCauley's class on, on a Wednesday night, the great, uh, the Global Methodist Church Catechism, and she was talking about the means of grace. Certainly we know these words, the means of grace. How is it that God's grace is imparted to us? There are spiritual practices that we do where God's grace infuses us, meets us, comes to us. And Jan talked about that, and I loved her words. This is so that God can truly connect to you and be known to you. God really wants you to know him as well. Therefore, when you practice the means of grace, like worship and communion and baptism and Bible study and prayer and service, all these things are ways in which God is working in us. These are meaningful activities that are like, if you would, the Lord has set for us a great table. And by coming to the table where we are now friends with God because of the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we can share in his goodness. We can share in his grace. The scripture continues, you anoint my head with oil. One interpretation is that the guests, as they would go to a, a home to share a meal with their friends, they would anoint every guest as they entered into their home with oil. You remember the parable, or not the parable, the story of Jesus who goes to the Pharisee's house, has a meal, and a woman interrupts the meal, anointing him with very expensive oil. The Pharisees get all upset, and what does Jesus say? I entered the home, you didn't even offer me any oil, and you didn't even wash my feet. Those were customary ways to honor someone and show hospitality. Friends, the Lord honors us by anointing us with, guess who? the Holy Spirit. Commentators agree that the Holy Spirit is truly the way that we are anointed as Christian followers on this side of Easter and Pentecost. It is the Lord who anoints us with the Holy Spirit. And friends, I was blessed to be with a couple this week who I was sharing some counseling with, and they said, you know, when we start having some challenges or we are, are struggling a little bit, we simply stop and say, come Holy Spirit. I wonder where they picked that up, right? From the church, come Holy Spirit, give us wisdom. Show us where we may be wrong in our actions. Show us where we are having a misunderstanding. Bring clarity, bring understanding. Again, getting back to Philip Keller, I've made reference to him in his books, how a shepherd used oil mixtures to protect his sheep. Sheep were also anointed with oil. So if you're a little squeamish before lunch with this, I apologize. But for those in agriculture, and this was confirmed by, we have a, a rancher in the 830 service who, who share with me these, uh, these things are still happening today. As sheep uh, get around these flies, these things called nose flies, or now they're known as nose bots, they land on the sheep's nose, they lay some eggs, those eggs turn into larvae, those larvae then make their way into the nasal patches of the sheep, 
And the sheep then have uh, these worms growing inside of them. They get severe headaches. They get severely agitated. And then they get very disruptive to the whole flock. And it must be treated. And it must be dealt with. But a good shepherd, when he sees the flies, will bring out the oil and begin to anoint his sheep's heads and their noses so that the nose flies cannot become irritants and do the damage to the flock. Again, we have a good shepherd who goes before us and who always is working the fields before us to make it good for us, to help us with the annoyances that oftentimes irritate our lives. And whether it's flies in the nose, which we don't even want to go there, right? But we have many irritants. I have irritants in my life. I'm sure you do as well. Are you asking God to help you with the things that irritate you? A good and loving shepherd who can go before you to to do the work, calling upon the Holy Spirit to help you change and grow through the adversity, through the challenges, through the adjutants that are sometimes helping us learn about ourselves more than learn about others. And lastly, this brings us to the concluding phrase, my cup overflows. I don't need to say much more here. Sarah had a great illustration for you. The Lord keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. The Lord is the most generous God, the most generous being ever. He wants to continue to give. We just need to be receiving of that and get rid of the things that are hindering the blessings that God is trying to give to us. A consistent theme of the Bible is that God's love is excessive. Our life in Christ is abundant, that God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or even imagine. God offers us peace that surpasses all understanding, and we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you want God to fill your life? Are you asking for God to fill your life? Your cup should be overflowing if you're in a posture of receiving that which God is desiring to give to you. Or has your heart become hard? Or have you walked away from God and you're no longer receiving the blessings from what we call those means of grace, spending every day with him, talking to him, praying with him, being in his presence, allowing him to clear pastures before you so that you can safely graze, rest, and be restored. God indeed is our good shepherd, and out of his abundant resources of extravagant love, he wants to fill our lives to overflowing. He walks with us through the valleys. He protects and cares and guides and inspects us with his rod and his staff. He prepares a table for us through the means of grace. He anoints us with the Holy Spirit of the oil, and he desires to give and allow our cups to overflow. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I am encouraged because I am blessed. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. I'd like to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning worship services at 8.30, 11 on our campus in downtown Tyler, Texas. I hope you'll visit our website to learn more about our church and ways that you can partner with us to make a difference for God's kingdom here in Tyler and around the world. May God bless you and may you have a great day.